With the series as massive as SpongeBob SquarePants, it's hard for anything relating to it to fall into obscurity. Even still, the SpongeBob PC games managed to slip under many people's radar. To this day, only a good few people who grew up with them are actually familiar with these titles. While there are a great many, let's focus on the first SpongeBob point-and-click game from AWE Games and published by THQ. This is SpongeBob SquarePants Employee of the Month. Unlike most other SpongeBob PC games, Employee of the Month was its own original story, not based on a movie or another video game. This is ironic given the fact that it shares a name with a pretty famous episode. This great childhood relic tells the story of SpongeBob receiving tickets to the theme park Neptune's Paradise as a reward for being Employee of the Year. Yeah, I know, the title lied to us. However, he and Patrick's journey to the Land of Wonders is met by many roadblocks and conflicts they must overcome to reach their destination. Will SpongeBob ever make it to the theme park to have the time of his life? Let's find out. Before we get to it, it's worth mentioning that many AWE games, including this one, have a hard time fully rendering on modern computers. Textures such as the white color don't always load, so it can make the games look kinda terrifying. Because of this, I'd like to thank AAWW1010 for providing the footage for this video. I've linked their channel in the description. The game kicks off with a comical intro showing the characters posing for the logo in a set resembling Spongebob's room. This is a nice little fourth wall break, but it's never entirely explained why they're all there or what exactly they're filming. Uh, wait! Don't you want to see my do- <laughs> <laughs> ah, <move on. laughs> Nothing like Sandy moonwalking while Plankton flies away saying something completely unrelated. Either way, Mr. Krabs receives mail right there on the set, and Squidward overhears that he's received two free tickets to Neptune's Paradise. Being the kind and generous neighbor that he is, in a strange act of kindness for the character, Squidward suggests Mr. Krabs give the tickets to Spongebob for being Employee of the Year. Mr. Krabs does exactly that, and Spongebob decides to give his other ticket to Patrick. Now they're ready to set off on a grand adventure to see the land of wonders that awaits them. Only one problem. They have no idea how to get there. Clearly this game came out before the internet and cell phones were as widely used as they are today. In the first stage, we see Spongebob going to the Krusty Krab to ask for directions. This is where we get our first look at how the game looks and how the music sounds. Oops! I hope no one hears that! It contains a mix of music from both the show and original music, but the original music is mostly borrowed from AWE's previous game, Operation Krabby Patty. This would start a trend for the rest of their series. The graphics being a blend of 2D and 3D would also be a trend throughout the series, and I really like the way it looks. It comes across as natural and not too jarring to see. To get through the Krusty Krab, you need to gather ingredients to make a sandwich for this random fish. Whoa, Spongebob. <laughs> Care to explain this? Both you and Plankton need to sort yourselves out. Yes. This stinks. What? Next, you head to the bus stop where you find Patrick with a sweet camera he won in a bikini contest. Patrick, you won a bikini contest? Well, I was the only male contestant, but the judges said I had the most unique figure. Trust me, we know. A new problem arises when you realize you don't have any bus tokens. Patrick comes up with this genius idea to find buried treasure to pay for the bus ride, since the Flying Dutchman's buried treasure is somewhere at Goo Lagoon. Before you go there, you can stop by this little store and see... Pretty jewelry. Right. Well, you seem busy. I'll leave you to your insane mutterings. Pretty jewelry. You can also talk to the clerk to get this cool videotape. The videotapes only really serve as bonus features, so you can do without them. At Goo Lagoon, there's a little minigame you can play that doesn't do anything, and a cool tanning salon castle from the looks of it. When you go to Muscle Beach, you see Larry working out, and he has the perfect toy shovel and pail to dig up treasure with. However, he refuses to give them to you since they're his best friends, apparently. More contacts may be needed here. Talking to him exploits that he misses eating homemade pies, so who better to get a homemade pie from than Grandma Squarepants? Also, the guy in the background is named Arnie. You can head to Grandma's house, and she literally does not recognize you at all. Me, your most favorite grandson. Oh, Patrick, 
is that you? What a pleasant surprise. Oh, it's so much nicer now that my puffy lumpy Patrick has come to visit me. I'm so sorry, Patrick. That's a little cruel, don't you think? They really played up her personality from the show to the max. Ignoring SpongeBob's tragic family life, Grandma says that she can't make her famous homemade pie because she's all out of urchin chips. Now it's off to the Bargain Mart. Here, you meet this hilarious clerk who has the best way of pronouncing Bargain Mart ever. Welcome to the Bargain Mart. Unfortunately, you haven't found your buried treasure yet, so you don't have any money. He makes a deal with you to clean his car in exchange for the urchin chip, so you get this mini game where you clean his car by moving SpongeBob across it. This minigame is a nice touch, but it feels a little out of place since there aren't really any other minigames like it throughout the game. I should also mention this guy who comes out wearing Mr. Krabs' clothes. I doubt that means anything. Once you go back inside, you can get your urchin chips, so you head to the back end, good grief, he's naked. The most unique figure. You bring the pie to Larry, and he's overcome by temptation. He eats it and has to go for a jog to run it off, allowing you to steal his beach toys for your own nefarious purposes. Yeah, Spongebob can be a little evil in this game. You head into the tanning salon castle only to find out that it's actually just a beach. Here you can get sunscreen from the owner or creep on some of the beachgoers. Wow! Pretty lady! Hi! I swear, I'm innocent! I didn't do anything! You can't prove that! I was only saying hi! Oh, well I'm busy. Busy doing nothing, that is. Okay, have fun! Okay, I seriously want to know what this guy did. They can't just keep us in the dark like that. You can also go to a bunch of sand pits to dig up the Dutchman's treasure. You have to dig until you find the right one, but there's no penalty for getting it wrong, really. When you dig up the treasure, you find it's just a chest full of bus tokens. I'm not sure why the Dutchman would ever need those, but these are the same guys that made Operation Krabby Patty, so the writing can't always be expected to make too much sense. When you bring the bus tokens to Patrick, the driver shows up, but he's terrible at his job because he doesn't want to drive because it's going to rain. He says he'll drive you if you can give him an umbrella, which doesn't make a whole lot of sense since he'd be in the bus the whole time, but okay, I guess. You go back to the beach and find an English lady who Spongebob shamelessly mocks the accent of. Wow, you sure do talk funny. Where are you from? I'm from the English Channel. You get her parasol in exchange for sunscreen and bring it back to the bus driver. Fun fact, this lady would later die in Battle for Bikini Bottom. Now we're on to level two, which takes place in Rock Bottom. For some reason, pretty much every Spongebob video game loved to make use of this location. I guess it made for a creepy setting, but it's still weird considering it only ever appeared in one episode. As you can guess, the bus ride didn't go so well, and surprisingly, it didn't have anything to do with Plankton. The sneaky little bugger climbed aboard because he's going somewhere, I suppose. Even major villains have to get around somehow. So an actual tornado appears, which Spongebob calls the Raging Whirlpool. God, I would kill for his optimism. And it carries the bus off to rock bottom. Outside, you see a guy kicking a can, and he looks suspiciously like the guy from the Krusty Krab. Say, don't I know you? Uh, no. Definitely not. I've never seen you before in my life. You're pretty, um, distinctive looking. I think I'd remember you. Oh well, you look familiar, but maybe my eyes are just playing tricks on me. Yeah, that's probably it, Spongebob. Say, if you've never seen me before, how did you know my name? Er, um, you just, uh, you look like a Spongebob, that's all. He blames the weather on a wizard named Marlin, who many people mention throughout the level. You steal his can and run away. Sorry I took your can. No problem. I hate you. Now you can go into the bus stop and talk to the woman behind the desk. Patrick also ran off somewhere, but the bus driver is sitting on the couch watching a parody of Chips called Chimps. The bus routes are cancelled because of the storm, so since you're going to be in rock bottom for a while, you ask the receptionist about the sights to see. She refuses to tell you until you get her a kelp bar, which in my opinion is a fireable offense for a receptionist. You go outside and use the bathroom, but in a moment of hilarity... <laughs> On the bright side, you find a quarter. You use it on the nearby snack machine to get a kelp bar. In exchange, the receptionist tells you that her twin sister works in a nearby radio station. Upon heading there, everything's a mess because the radio's antenna is broken and a guy out back is fixing it. On top of it, the wizard we heard about cursed the back door so it would never open. As it turns out, a celebrity news reporter named Gary Gulper works here, and the locked room houses his new invention. Because news reporters invent things. It's so surreal to see Rock Bottom treated as an actual civilization and not just a creepy dark trench where monsters live. It's actually kind of nice. 
Also, we get this little line of fourth wall breaking. Ooh, Operation Krabby Patty. That was my very first game. Actually, SpongeBob, it was Legend of the Lost Spatula. The guy out back is angry because the antenna isn't actually broken, and you'll never believe what his name is. You asked to borrow his really neat tools for something. Are those your tools? Is anything mine? I mean, what do you mean by mine? I don't own anything. Possessions just drag you down. Those tools are merely my temporary companions. I respect them, and they respect me. Oh, okay. Then can I respectfully borrow them? Wow, that's the second guy to personify objects in this game. Jojo says he'll let you borrow them if you bring him a kelp seed, the Spongebob version of Pepsi. So you head to the Rusty Anchor Tavern where Mermaid Man and Barnacle Boy are in the parking lot, but Mermaid Man has had a little too much to drink. Imagine going to a bar in a strange lost town and meeting two major celebrities outside. Either way, Mermaid Man just lost a drinking contest to Patrick and now he's too sick to move. You need help from a big buff guy to lift him into the invisible boatmobile. You tell the big tough guy inside about it, and he asks you to watch the bar for him while he goes to help Mermaid Man. Since you helping me out, feel free to help yourself to as much of that Diet Cola as you like. It doesn't sell very well anyway. He sure is a lot nicer than the guys over at Thug Tug. You can now get a glass of Kelpsy- Oh wait, it's actually Diet Coral Cola with a lemon twist. So they have both Pepsi and Coca-Cola in this universe. Wait till they hear about Dr. Puffer. To deceive the Joestar repairman, you put the Kelpsy in the can you stole from the guy at the bus stop. He approves of it and lets you borrow his tools. You now pretend to be the repairman, so the receptionist lets you go backstage to meet Gary Gulper. But wait, you can also go to the recording room to see Plankton trying to film a commercial for the Chum Bucket. He fools you into thinking it's a public service announcement, so he makes you record him. It's kind of funny, but it's also meaningless apart from the bonus videotape you get from it. I, for one, think we need more PSAs about the benefits of eating chum. Oh, I'm innocent! I would never dream of doing the things those bottom-feeding reporters accuse me of. Those pictures were clearly faked! Were they now? Now you can go backstage and meet Gary Gulper, who is way too full of himself. Wow! Aren't you Gary Gulper, the weatherman? Why, yes I am. Aren't you lucky? Well, yeah. And that's not all. Really? Really. In addition to the pleasure of meeting me, I happen to be in an autograph signing mood. Will your luck never end? He tells you about his invention that's capable of controlling the weather, and he also mentions the folktale that tells of the wizard named Marlin who controls the weather in Rock Bottom. There's a possibility that Marlin is making it storm out of anger. From looking at a little radar, you can find the coordinates to a zone where the weather never changes. You assume this is Marlin's lair, so you head there to confront the wizard. His lair turns out to be an oversized hat, which houses a maze of caves. You can spin the slot machine out front to find the order you take the paths in the maze, then you're able to travel through an overhead game all the way to Marlin's private quarters where... Hey! What's Patrick doing here? It's never actually explained, but Marlin's a nice guy who's laying Patrick sleep off his Kelpsy drunkenness. <gasps> a blue potion of Whoa. healing! Quick, where's my 20-sided die? Marlin says he won't stop making it rain until Gary Gulper pays for trying to steal his job. SpongeBob offers to do what he does best, cause chaos, and Marlin comes up with an idea. Marlin gives you a magic wand and asks you to sabotage Gary Gulper's machine while posing as Jojo. This way, Marlin will have full control of the weather again. In order to make it stop raining, you oblige and proceed to destroy the machine by unlocking the cursed door with the magic wand. Okay, Patrick, now be real careful. I can do it! I can do it! I'm winning! I'm winning! Faster, Patrick! We get a fun little cutscene of SpongeBob and Patrick destroying everything, then everything returns to normal. You ride on the bus back to Bikini Bottom, leaving Rock Bottom behind you. But the bus driver is slowly getting fed up with his passenger's antics. He decides to kick them off the bus by a diner, and this kicks off the next level, back to square one. Inside the diner, Patrick is indulging in a pretty tasty looking sandwich, and SpongeBob is about ready to give up on his journey. However, with encouragement from Patrick, he decides to keep going and thinks of a brilliant idea. Rather than just, you know, getting another bus, he decides to get Sandy's rocket to fly them the rest of the way. A little excessive, but okay. By complete coincidence, the waitress just got an order from Sandy who's in jellyfish fields because I guess Sandy jellyfishes now. The waitress takes your word for it when you tell her you know Sandy because she sends you to give Sandy her baby back ribs in jellyfish fields. 
Honestly, everyone with a job in this game should seriously be fired. How irresponsible can you get? You can also change the music with this jukebox and play darts. I'm ready! Yippee! In Jellyfish Fields, you can get stung by jellyfish, but it doesn't really do anything. It's not like you have a health bar or something like that. You bring Sandy her baby back ribs, and by yet another complete coincidence, Sandy has tickets to Neptune's Paradise too. You might be thinking this is pretty absurd, but believe it or not, the game actually kinda explains this. Apparently, almost everyone around town seems to be getting these tickets, and while we never find out why they're going around, we can just assume the theme park felt generous. Ever hear of junk mail that actually follows through on its promises? Maybe I shouldn't be deleting all those random emails. You head back home to get your water helmet, but get this, there's a freaking snake in it. You can also find the easiest videotape ever just by opening your closet. Now you have to go to Squidward's house to borrow his clarinet. Apparently Spongebob has a degree in snake charming and can use the clarinet to charm the snake away. Only one problem. Squidward is fast asleep and won't wake up. Now would be a great time for Spongebob's coincidence blessing to kick in. Oh, look at that. A store on TV sells dream glasses. Glasses that literally take you into someone else's dream. I have many, many, many questions, but my mind's already been boggled enough by the weather controlling wizard, so let's just go with it. You head to the store to get the dream glasses, and I never knew how much I needed to hear Spongebob reference the Doobie Brothers. That calendar needs to be updated. Who are the Doobie Brothers? You also meet the guy from the Krusty Krab and Rock Bottom bus stop. He sure gets around, doesn't he? Still, he denies ever seeing you before in his life. The guy at the store gives you the dream glasses for free because he doesn't believe in money, relying solely on a trust fund to keep his store running. He's also the third stoner you meet in this game. Not sure why AWE had an obsession with this archetype. Your feet might go in circles, but your mind soars with the eagles. Wow, you have a really intense aura. It's yellow. Want me to read the bumps on your head? You can now go into Squidward's dream and become an amalgamation of matters beyond human comprehension. Walking through a simultaneously heavenly and hellish tentacle acres, you reach a building where the octopus is giving a god-awful clarinet recital to an adoring audience. You just up and walk on stage with him and pretend to be him from another dream. You tell him you need the clarinet and he's actually in a dance recital. He gives you his clarinet and begins to dance, but we don't really see any audience reaction, so the joke is kinda lost on me. See for effort. Somehow bringing the clarinet into the real world, you go to charm the snake and you can now use your water helmet to enter Sandy's tree dome. However, she's ready to give you one last mission before you go. She's lost the oxygen tanks. You don't have to look very far to find them, so I'm not really sure why this mission is here to begin with, but maybe it's to foreshadow the fact that the oxygen tanks will be in your inventory for the entire next level. Patrick shows up after eating the entire diner, and he ends up standing on the line while the oxygen is being pumped into the rocket. It breaks, which prevents the rocket from being fully fueled, but somehow Sandy fails to notice this. Like in the bus, chaos ensues in the rocket. Patrick regrets eating so much when he has to use the bathroom and Sandy realizes the rocket is out of oxygen. Because of this, it crashes through a billboard and breaks down in the middle of a fancy neighborhood called Bottoms Up. This is the final stage of the game. Patrick runs off to find a bathroom while Sandy starts to work on fixing the rocket. She sends you to Oxygen Springs to fill up the empty oxygen tanks, but once you get there, the talking security camera says you can't come in because their guests are required to wear a jacket. By yet another coincidence, Sandy happens to have a friend who lives nearby. His name is Calfish Craig, and he lives in a very high-class neighborhood, or rather, outside of it, called Waverly Hills. I hope there's a fish version of Weezer that made a song about it. Waverly Hills has quite a few gorgeous-looking houses, including one made entirely out of gold. Imagine living in any of these. Right across the fence is a dirty old shack that could only belong to a certain Cowfish Craig. His neighbor, Carlton Ritz, is angry because his tree of golden coconuts leaned over the fence and Cowfish Craig took one of them. You go into the nice old shack, which actually looks kinda cozy, and you have a nice little chat with Cowfish Craig. Surprisingly, he doesn't mention Sandy at all, just how much he hates his neighbor and all the rich people who live across from him. He's also from Texas somehow. Calfish Craig also tells you you can get a jacket from Sublime Seafood since they always give them to their customers before seating them. After gaining his trust, you sneak into his back room to steal his stolen coconut, and I think this is supposed to be a Raiders of the Lost Ark parody? 
I'm not sure, but there was a period in time where everyone parodied that scene, so it probably is. You swap the golden coconut for a regular one and return it to Carlton Ritz. In exchange, he gives you a quarter. I bet he found it in the sewers of Rock Bottom. After leaving the snobby neighborhood, you can magically reconstruct the sign you crashed through and get the phone number for Sublime Seafoods. 555-4444. Hello, this is Sublime Seafoods. How may I help you? Give me your jacket. When you get there, the very intimidating bouncer, sorry, the very unintimidating bouncer, tells you that you can't come in without an invitation. Luckily for you, there's a contest going on that's giving out a free invitation to anyone who can guess the company's new slogan. This contest is a little awful because it's literally on the restaurant's sign. You use some binoculars to look over the kelp forest, wow, canon location placement, and you get a nice view of the slogan which simply reads, tastes like chicken. Now, I have to address the elephant in the room. This is a seafood restaurant in the middle of the ocean. It's a common joke that cannibals say human flesh tastes like chicken, so this game just outright acknowledged its blatant cannibalism in the most unsubtle way possible. Cannibalism is actually a thing in the SpongeBob universe, and no one has a problem with it. I guess that's how it is in nature, so I'm not sure why I'm surprised, but I didn't expect it to be canon here. These fish have whole societies, why do they have to eat each other? When you get inside, the shrimp Matra D sends you to get a jacket from their closet. Once you're looking snazzy, you can head into the restaurant where Larry's twin brother serves you. He probably serves his brothers too. He tells you a bunch of menu items if you ask for them, but the dumbass sponge somehow thinks he can get a Krabby Patty in this foreign land. This infuriates the waiter who views this as beneath their high society. So he physically throws Spongebob out of the restaurant and forgets to take his jacket back. Again, everyone with a job in this game needs to be fired. Now you can get into Oxygen Springs where you find exactly where Patrick ended up going to the bathroom. He tells you he got in by climbing over some coral, which makes you feel like a complete buffoon, but at least you got a fun adventure out of it. He can't leave yet because he's lost his pants. You go to find them, and a videotape, and look who it is. The same guy you've seen in every town. SpongeBob is downright insistent he's seen this guy before, but his suspicions are laid to rest when a series of guys who look exactly like him walk through. Turns out, this guy has tons of twin brothers all over the ocean. Nice to see some finality to this little subplot. Also, one of them had Patrick's pants for some reason. You return them and then you're ready to go. You fill up the oxygen tanks and then head off to finish your adventure. Once you reach Neptune's Paradise, you find that the park is closed. Supposedly, there's a reservation for a party. For who, you ask? Spring Boob Squire Pin. Nah, it's actually Spongebob. And all your friends jump out and yell surprise. So that's why everyone around town got invitations out of the blue. Still not really explained, but okay. Get Broncos! This roller coaster reminds me of the rodeos back home! Spongebob, if you could only see your face. You know how stupid you look. Look alive, SpongeBob! Woo -hee 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 -hee! This is the bestest day ever! At the end of the day, everyone walks off into the sunset and the game ends. Though they forget about Patrick. Kinda nice to see how everyone you deceived and stole from is happy to celebrate your honor. So, how does this marvelous adventure of ours hold up? It's campy, it's goofy, there are a ton of things that don't make sense. But you know what? It's amazing. This game is so much fun, and one I can proudly say I spent half my childhood playing. It makes use of every Spongebob element it can, and it portrays the world in such a way that's enjoyable to play through and experience. AWE may have been unique with their take on the Spongebob universe, but they sure did a good job with it. My biggest criticism would have to be the lack of features. I don't mind it being linear, but it's a little short, and as a kid I always tried to see if I could find new things to do after beating it for the billionth time. A short game, but a cute and enjoyable one. I absolutely love this game, and thinking about it almost brings a tear to my eye. Hopefully others who grew up with it feel the same way, because this is one Spongebob relic that should never ever be forgotten. Thank you all so much for watching, I will see you in the next memory.